Hey, it's Chris, the Supply Chain Doctor and Apex Coach, providing you insights and tools to better understand and apply the Apex body of knowledge to everyday supply chains. In this part two interview, we continued our discussion with John Hill, industry veteran in the data collection and warehouse management system space, to get a better understanding of the history of this important supply chain industry. It all sounds pretty boring, so let's see if John can prove me wrong. John, thanks again for giving us more time to speak with you about your career and learn more about the history and a little bit about the future of WMS industry. In part one, we went back to the late 1960s and discussed reflective tape and data collection. We spoke a little bit about Logisticon and kind of your progression up through the ranks, but let's kind of pick it up from, uh, you know, from maybe the mid-90s and kind of what was going on then. Well, I'll do that, but if I may digress and stop me at any time. There was a couple of interesting things that happened after the barcode days. Mm -hmm. I mentioned during our last session that the decade plus that I spent in the barcode interest industry taught me a number of lessons, chief among which, aside from Joe Kleinkemper and the importance of workforce engagement in building corporate ownership of new technology, was the indisputable fact that a barcode is little more than a curious decoration unless it has been accurately printed and applied to an item. And until it is read and validated by a high performance scanner and decoder before the data that it contains is subsequently fed to a programmable logic controller or computer for action or storage. I bring this up, Chris, because I find, at least in the last five years or so, barcode is taken for granted by the marketplace. And there's some basics and fundamentals that I won't dwell on here, but the new users of those of that technology need to pay attention to as they go forward. It is not a slam dunk. Now, let me fast forward talk about my foray into RFID. I live south of Santa Cruz, California, and I was brought here in 1981 by a legendary entrepreneur who also happened to be the CEO of one of the nation's oldest tanneries. I said tanneries, like cattle hides and sheep hides sure. and what have you. Working with scientists from Los Alamos, Norman was looking to find a way to track cattle hides from ranches to his plant, to his tanning plant. Clearly a barcode wouldn't work, but he had developed, with help from Los Alamos, to create, or he developed, subdermal RFID tags. And the solution he and his team came up with worked. And it played a key role in assuring rancher and uh, animal processing plant compliance with the tannery traceability mandate and quality standards. He hired me, Norman Lesson did, to find other applications for the technology. It wasn't an easy task at the time, but the exercise reinforced something that I learned at 3M in my early career. That being that the cost of an item must be somewhere in the neighborhood of that item's value in the eyes of prospective buyer, and that that value has to be clearly articulated by the seller. And finally, that the product itself has to substantiate the claims. Our first RFID tag at Norman's company sold for $80, a far cry from Walmart's dream of a two cent label but they were reusable and on average could take 100 trips down an automobile assembly line, triggering the delivery of the right components to the line at the right location and time and maintaining vehicle-specific audit trails along the way. Now, if you do the math, that's 80 cents a trip, a small price to pay for a bundle of value, that value being a properly assembled automobile. On the other hand, 80 cent tag wouldn't work on a box of cornflake. 
and therein lay the rub. A year later, a chance meeting on a return flight to the West Coast led to an investment from and the subsequent acquisition of Norman's company by a division of Rockwell. At that point in my life, with a wife and two daughters who had become confirmed Californians, I could not even suggest a move to the upper Midwest when serendipity struck again. And we're getting to WMS here shortly. In 1974, at the National Material Handling Show in Chicago, I had an opportunity to chat with Vince Accapinti, the founder and CEO of the first WMS company, Logisticon. Vince is the father of WMS. He painted a wonderful picture of radio-controlled warehouses where operators were directed and lift trucks guided by wireless technology and software that would take the guesswork out of receiving, put away, picking, and shipping. And at that time, 1974, he offered me a job. I politely declined. Ten years later, in 1984, Vince's CEO, twice removed, offered me a position on Logisticon's board of directors, which I accepted. And a year later, the board invited me to take the CEO slot. With few other options at the time on the West Coast, I accepted. And then the fun began. After settling in about two weeks at Logisticon, getting to know the home office team and familiarizing myself with the product, I went to the field to meet the customers, sometimes with the salespeople responsible for the accounts and oftentimes on my own. I learned more in the next three or four weeks than I ever would have learned on the phone or sitting behind my desk. On the customer side, most were quite pleased with the performance of their WMSs. Our technical team who supported installation and our 24 by 7 support group, except for the Rust Belt Company, whose IT chief had taken it upon himself to modify our WMS source code beyond recognition and not document what he had done before he left the company. At the end of that visit, I apologized to the CEO and CFO of the Rust Belt Company and wrote them a check for $25,000, which they had paid for the first year of our support. I had never done that before, and fortunately, I've never done it since. It was a no-win situation, and the salesperson should have spotted the issue long before he closed the deal. Speaking of sales, let me characterize the Logisticon sales team as white-gloved, well-dressed, and articulate, but unfamiliar with the difference between a warehouse and an outhouse. <laughs> In my experience, seasoned warehouse practitioners can spot a charlatan at the reception desk, if not in the parking lot. I provide a job search report for each of the four salespeople at Logisticon, and within six weeks was fortunate enough to replace them with grizzly veterans with engineering degrees who knew warehousing and understood the WMS value proposition. With a new team on the front end, few competitors, a partnership with Hewlett Packard, and a modest infusion of venture capital, we grew revenues to above six and a half million within about four years. What I learned during that time and a lesson that I impart to anyone who is interested in taking, going forward with a warehouse management system is that overlaying any new technology or system on ill-defined processes will only enable employees to do things badly faster. What I'd like to do now, if, if, if I may, Chris, is answer some of your questions. I have a list of things that I deem to be fairly important in putting together a WMS requirements list, but I'd like to get your input as well. 
I'm just throwing darts out there because whatever you say is going to be certainly infinitely more interesting than what I say. Well, we'll see. Uh, we, we can measure that after we're done. I heard on a webinar that you had mentioned J.C. Penney's was a first user of WMS. Is that accurate? or? Yeah, and it was that, actually Vince Acapendi, the guy from 1974's Material Handling Show, who put that system in. And he had come out of the Raymond Corporation, subsidiary of Raymond called Mobility Systems. It was 74. It was J.C. Penney. And they had radio terminals on lift trucks and wires in the floor to guide the trucks to their various destinations in, in the Penny's facility. So that's a check mark. I got that one right. <laughs> you did. You know, what? One, one point we talked last time about the, the Buick installation of barcoding. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this is a sidebar. That was in October of 1971, a good two or three years before the Marsh supermarket deployment uh, of a UPC uh, scanning system at their checkout counters. So we on the industrial side of the equation do indeed predate UPC. I just wish I had a, a penny for each of the barcode labels that have been scanned since that time. And are still being scanned. Exactly. It kind of drives the world these days. You formed associations. I know we, in the prior call we spoke about AIM. You were involved with others as well? Right. I stuck with MHI, which was the godfather of, of AIM, and I stayed with the organization because you can just find such an amazing number of opportunities through the networking that that particular organization provides. I joined MHI, as I said last time, in 1971, but I've stayed with them since. I still uh, participate in their meetings as we go along. In the mid-90s, with a number of companies offering warehouse management systems in the marketplace, we also collectively needed a broader platform to outline our message and the potential value that could be obtained from their deployment. In 1995, I believe, may have been late 94, we founded MHI's Warehouse Management Systems Group, WMS organization, under the MHI umbrella. We had a few marketing people who attended the meetings. And they thought that warehouse management systems was a bit passe and we needed a, a more interesting name for the group. So from 94 or 5 to the early 2000s, we transitioned to a group called the Supply Chain Execution System Group, or association, underneath, again, the MHI umbrella. And anyone looking at WMS, either from a historical point of view or alternatively, uh, as a first pass before they move ahead with procurement and deployment of one of them, MHI is still a great resource. We did a lot of work on developing standards and specifications, copies of which I still in the, see in the marketplace today. How big was the, how many members did you get eventually? Well, we started with four or five, and within a year we had 29. And that was tip of the iceberg because behind those 29 were another 100 or 150 companies offering WMS. And therein lay the rub. It was about that time we were approaching the year 2000 challenges that the computer industry had to grapple with uh, as we changed centuries. And uh, a number of people in the software development arena went out looking for work, and they found warehouse management as a possible place, imagining that, uh, you know, how complicated can a warehouse be? Stuff comes in, it's put somewhere, it's picked up, it's brought to a shipping dock, and it's shipped somewhere. Well, as most of us know who've been around for any length of time, it's a good bit more than that. But we had 
nearly 200 WMS companies across the globe, the majority of them here in the U.S. by the early 2000s. And you remember uh, the Gartner, the Magic Quadrant, the Gartner Magic Quadrant grid, that was always popular? It, it was and remains so. And that was Tom Ryan. You, you know Tom Ryan, perhaps. I talked to Tom Ryan last week. Yeah, hey, yeah, he was, I don't think he was the creator, but back when I was coming of age, that was, he was kind of the uh, holder of the key for getting into the grid and getting rated and those types of things. And that's where I had mentioned to you, I learned about companies like Catalyst and Manhattan Associates and McHugh Freeman. There were a lot of companies back then. And, and John, I'm still surprised today. There are still probably that many companies out there and, and ones that are starting up. Why do you think that is? Well, I would like to think first that the people doing the work in the WMS sphere are perhaps more sophisticated, more talented, more seasoned uh, than the crowd we ran into in the 90s. But the flip side is they're put in this country, aside from pantries and storage bins in your backyard, they're a good 600,000 warehouses in the United States. And my guess is even if we do a cutoff at, say, 50,000 square feet for a warehouse, the likelihood is that we've only tapped 35 or 40 percent of the available market for WMS. It just doesn't stop, and that's exciting. There is a group in Europe similar to Gartner, different but, but similar called the Fraunhofer Group, who keeps tabs on what's going on in Europe and Asia very, very effectively. And I source them from time to time for information on companies over there who may not be terribly active in the United States, but indeed are active in the rest of the world. Fraunhofer, how do you spell that, John? Now you're testing me. F-R-A-U-N-H-O-F-E-R. I used to speak German, but that's a long time ago. And there isn't enough good wine around that would enable me to do a better job of pronouncing that language. What happened at Logisticon? They, they're not around anymore, I don't think. Well, Logisticon imploded, and um, I, I choose that word carefully. It got almost too big for its own britches, and two things happened to uh, bring it to finality in the late 80s, early 90s. One of them was that uh, the pharmaceutical marketplace was a hot one for WMS, but the FDA uh, introduced requirements for documentation that were beyond the resources available to the majority of the WMS providers. We spent, for example, in 1988 or so, over a million dollars on documenting our software at Logisticon to meet the FDA requirements, and that almost broke the bank. Today, that's very popular still with serialization and oh, documenting your, your system even, changes. Even more so, and more important. We didn't, we didn't have the net. We didn't have the level of, for example, counterfeiting that are present throughout the supply chain or that is present throughout the supply chain. Back then, we may have had it, but we didn't know it uh, that we do today. And the availability of traceability tools, not unlike WMS, transportation management systems and the like, the industry is doing a very, very good job. You know, Chris, if I, if I may, a couple of things as, as I was collecting my, my various thoughts in preparation for our two discussions, I think I'd like to put a title on it. I'll call it Getting Back to Basics. I said it earlier with respect to barcoding. The fundamentals still apply. And on the WMS side, I mentioned doing things badly faster with new technology. 
when when a company and now now this is is for the prospective users and perhaps for those who want to go in and get more out of their WMS than they currently are. I've read a couple of times it's probably apocryphal that on average 65 to 70 percent of the functionality delivered with WMSs is rarely used. It's it's hearsay, but it's hearsay from people in the marketplace. I think it's worth uh, worth noting. Why do you think that happens, John? I, 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 it, it's a function of the quality of the WMSs that a given prospective user is looking for and the fact that there are a lot of very nifty features offered to differentiate the, the products that they're selling from the other ones on the market. And sometimes you can say, oh, well, you know, boy, that looks good. I bet we could use that. And it's my question to them is, what can you use today? What will really get you where you want to be in terms of incremental levels of improvement over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months? And take baby steps to the door or on your way forward. I viewed it just from my, my short tenure in the space. Often lack of training, full <laughs> full training, and then, or the people that were trained leave, and then it's not carried on. And then you mentioned something earlier, John, documentation. Good Lord, yes, critical. If you missed it in our last broadcast, early in my career, I was a smoker, courtesy of Uncle Sam and the U.S. Army, and I learned more in a 10-minute smoke break in the yard outside the warehouse door from the people who actually did the work than I would in a one-hour, two-hour conference room session with senior management. And that's still true. We don't spend enough time getting the workforce engaged early on in the process of uh, assessing what new technology might be able to do for throughput and productivity in a warehouse or distribution center. That said, there are a couple of other points that are, worth, I believe, worth mentioning. First, the importance of gathering accurate data to the extent that a company can do it on current operations. What comes in, how much, what's it look like? what goes out, how much, when, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Documenting every step of the warehousing process in receiving, storage, picking, value-added processing, consolidation, and packaging, and ultimately staging for shipment. These are the primary areas that a good or solid WMS should be able to handle and handle well. How it does so depends upon how well you characterize current operations. So at, at any rate, that's one of them. Another one is developing key performance indicators. Now most people are familiar with the acronym KPI. Georgia Tech for years did a good job of developing KPIs for warehousing. The Warehouse Education Research Council does an excellent job uh, led by a team. In fact, you may know him, Chris, Carl Manrup. Yes, sir. That is an invaluable tool if people take the time to obtain it from work and use it to measure how they're doing with respect to others. Now, that said, nobody knows a warehouse your warehouse better than you do. And if that can't be said, then you better go do your homework. <laughs> but you need to identify what's meaningful, what will add value, and what will reduce cost in each of the areas that are primary in your facility. Another item that I had on my list, you need to document and do process flowing or diagramming on your current processes 
and then use those as a foundation for identifying ways of tightening up flows, improving the throughput, shortcutting or eliminating unnecessary steps in the process, and building a set of target performance indicators. If I'm, I'm doing so many cartons per hour or, or week, uh, how many could I do if I had the tools in place from a software point of view, and if I fine-tune the physical processes to streamline the process diagramming? Now, let's say that we've, got a, we've identified our KPIs. They provide an invaluable tool for building the bid business case and the actual value proposition. Envision, if you will, a series of tables, uh, one for receiving, another for storage and put away, another for value-added processing, another for packing, shipping, and so on. And then create another table that illustrates what a better physical layout and process flow would do to those KPIs and focus your attention on getting those things fixed first. Then finally, begin to take a look at what would happen to those flows and to your productivity with the addition of automatic identification, a warehouse management system, a labor management system, and compare the results. And the final step, and, and have your people involved, make sure you have your people involved in filling out those charts for and with you. Then the next step, how do you put a, a dollar value on these things? You can't do it in a vacuum. You need to get insights from, from your workforce. How much faster could you do this? How much damage do you think could be reduced if we did that, et cetera, et cetera. Then sit down with representatives of the various departments in the organization, for example, marketing and sales, finance, the operations chief or senior vice president, and say, here's what the team came up with in terms of establishing where we are today and where we might be able to go with the addition of technology and a warehouse management system, for example. And how much do you think that is worth Mr. Head of Sales or Ms. Marketing Vice President, and spread it around the room. It's in a conference room. You're talking to your senior staff or senior management group. Ask them to put a value on the performance improvements that you see. And don't let up. Be persistent. Well, it's about such and such, says the Head of Sales. Well, no, you need to drill down and get hard and fast answers from them on what a 10% improvement in throughput might do to lift sales, for example. Then you turn to finance. What's that likely to be worth if we were able to achieve it? You can put together, in fact, I think I'm thinking of a Canadian company with whom we did work years ago, who put these charts together, established a comparison between today's performance and possible performance with the installation or implementation of some barcode reading and a warehouse management system. Put them in the charts for a presentation to the, oh, they're about a $400 million Canadian company for their board of directors. The presentation took, oh, it was given by the head of operations and the senior vice president of distribution. It took about a half an hour. It was a lot of work to put it together, but it only took six weeks to put it together in substantiable detail, and they approved it as presented. Now, one other thing that I commend to your readership is something called the DuPont model. It's a financial tool, and at Georgia Tech, uh, they spend a half a semester teaching it, so I'm not going to even attempt it except to say look it up and take a look at what you've put together in those charts that is 
compare current operations versus could be operations and see if you can't plug some of the numbers into the DuPont model in order to calculate probable return on investment, return on assets, and a number of other financial measures. This Canadian company I mentioned did just that, and it was a slam dunk. I used that phrase twice in this last hour, but it was a fairly straightforward presentation and easy sell on the part of the people who were actually going to buy and use the system. Final comment on them. Remember, the likely cost of the improvements that the Canadians proposed they were to put in was about a million six, and the return they expected to achieve was somewhere in the neighborhood, and they were a little optimistic in my view, of 1.8 million. As it turns out, they invested $2 million, and their first year's return on that investment was 1.6. That's not small potatoes. That's a pretty darn good profile, and one likely to get the attention of senior management. It's interesting you mentioned the well, you said work, you threw work in there, and I didn't realize we would get a, a mini crash course on WMS selections and best practice implementations, and, the, and then you talked about the DuPont model. John, I used to do WMS seminars with, with work meant back in the mid-90s uh, with Eric Peters. I don't know if you, if you know Eric yeah, Peters. I think I do you do know so. Eric. Yeah, he taught me about the DuPont model. That was part of what we spoke about. I went on to write a book for work called WMS Selection Strategies. So a lot of that I learned from Eric, who I imagine learned it from you. Yeah, Eric and I did work together. Though speaking of the work, it sounds like you've done implementations and consulting recently. Is, is that what you're doing now? Well, let's say I'm, I'm in the catbird seat now. By that I mean I'm sit, sitting on a branch up above the fray, providing input and insights to the team that actually is doing the, the serious work of mm -hmm. assisting in identification of alternative solutions and selection of the best ones for the company's individual clients. Are we allowed to say St. Ange? Is that yes, who you're we with? pronounced it correctly, and I appreciate it. They've been around for a while. Were you part of Cyprus, Cyprus Associates after after right. this time? Well, we founded, a couple of us founded a company called Cyprus Associates. And if the truth be known, where did I get Cyprus? I don't know if you're a golfer, but I was invited to uh, play Cyprus Point uh, the Sunday before we put the company together. And it seemed a natural name for, for the organization that we were about to build. And our first job was that Canadian company that I mentioned. Okay. It was a, a pure consulting play. My wife said I was old enough to be a consultant, perhaps. Enough gray I hair, perhaps. Yeah, and strangely enough, the hair hasn't changed. But I, I haven't stopped learning, and I continue to learn every day, as, as I hope everybody does. You and I may talk about uh, later on at Cypress Associates. Just imagine, Chris, and an audience. If you had a tool, today I would, I would call it a child of artificial intelligence that would enable you to put all the profiling data that I quickly scanned over into it to help you fairly quickly reconfigure from a physical point of view the way the flows ought to be in a given operation. And once you've done that, and figured out how much those changes were going to cost you, then overlay on top of that the functionality that you've defined for a warehouse management system, and then run it as a simulation and determine where the pinch points are, fine-tune the model, and out will pop the costs for your physical improvements in the system that you've defined to run them or to make them play. And so you do that, you buy the system, you buy the physical equipment, you implement and get it running, and a year or two down the road, you decide that you're going to expand or you're going to contract. 
How about something that enables you to go back into the model, tweak it, and change it to reflect what you now have to do and go through the process all over again? That's what we were doing at Cypress Associates. And my friend who I mentioned in the last session, Dave Scott, and a number of other very solid people put that together and actually developed and, and ran it. The funding fell out at the time in the early 90s, well, by the mid-90s, and the company who had sponsored the development decided to get out of the warehouse management and logistics business. That said, somebody's going to do it, and the people who are working on AI and machine learning uh, for the logistics industry or community are going to do that someday. I, I hope I'm here to see it. Yeah, I thought you were describing a future state product, and you were. Then you said that's something you did many years ago. Interesting. Well, it's it. It, it. it took some pretty solid people to take those ideas and turn them into working uh, systems. But nonetheless, it it's doable. And I just saw an AI company that's recently been launched uh, by Princeton University, which kind of looks like it may have the secret sauce to do this again. And on the theme of consulting companies, you were also part of eSync? Yeah, eSync was founded by people who came out of the WMS industry. One company in particular that's no longer with us called Mark, if you remember them, and RGTI. You know Bob Kennedy? Does that name ring a bell? I know Bob Kennedy very well, thank you. You know everybody, John. Well, if you live long enough. <laughs> now, I've been blessed with the networks that have admitted me to their fold. I saw you have, what in 2004, the Reed Apple Award. What what was that for? Oh, it, it means I show, it, it, it awarded me points for showing up at MHI meetings. Okay. Actually, no, it's, I'm not quite that, but... Rudy Reed was a professor from Purdue, and Jim Apple Sr. was a professor at Georgia Tech. And from the academic perspective, these were the two gentlemen who really gave the world you and I and those listening live in a shot in the arm. And so the, the Reed Apple Award recognizes people who have contributed throughout their careers uh, to the advancement of the material handling and logistics industry. Yeah, I'm familiar with Jim Apple. That makes sense. Well, you know the Jim Apple the Younger, probably. Probably, yes, sir. Yeah, he's 60 now, so he's okay. the kid. And if he, if by any chance he happens to be listening, I say that in jest. Okay. The apple didn't fall. Oh, God, what a horrible pun. But it didn't <laughs> fall very far from the tree. And Jim yes. and his dad, Jim, not Junior, but Jim the Younger, and his dad made enormous contributions to, to our industry. Well, John, I want to get maybe your predictions on the future of the WMS industry. Is there, before we do, is there anything else from the historical perspective or? You know, getting oh, up to where we are today. Don't wind me up. <laughs> no, I. Future, it's morphing, to use that term, millennial term, I guess. But nonetheless, the industry is changing. For example, and I say this hopefully with impunity, those 29 companies that formed MHIs. WMS and subsequently supply chain execution systems and technology groups has morphed into something called MHI's solutions community, which effectively recognize the fact that you can't fit square peg in a, in a round hole. It recognized the pervasiveness of the systems that have been developed help people do a better job of moving products through the supply chain from source to consumption in, a, in an effective, efficient manner. 
it's not just WMS, it's not just transportation management systems or labor management. It's the entire group of them working together in an efficient, effective, significant way such that the sum of the components exceeds the value of the total package. And MHI Solutions Community provides a, a, a venue for both suppliers of technology, developers of systems, and users of the two uh, can communicate, collaborate, and move the, the package forward. I, I, I miss the WMS group, but they're part of the solutions community now. I miss a, a number of things that were enjoyable parts of my career, but I can't wait to see what the new breed brings. And WMS won't go away, at least in, well, I could say this safely, at least not in my lifetime. But the concepts will survive me and those who are currently playing the game with things that we barely imagined at this point in time. Somebody's going to develop that system that I mentioned Cyprus put together back in the early 90s and it's going to blow people's socks off. Yeah, I've noticed a, a migration. Seldom is it just a standalone WMS anymore. It's, it's WMS and warehouse control systems and robotics. So, you know, just from the recent Modex earlier this year, there was a lot, a lot of consolidation. Absolutely. Warehouse execution systems, don't forget them. Oh, yes. It, it's, it's not alphabet soup. But in order to understand the differentiators between those alternative packages, people really need to dig down and determine what they need and then go out and take a look at what's available to do it correctly the first time. Again, I appreciate your time. Anything else before I ask you my final question? Well, I can't wait for your final question, no. Final today. So. Okay, Chris. One thing I always like to wrap up on is getting people's perspective on careers in supply chain management. So if you were able to tell someone coming out of going into college or coming out of college or even making a transition into supply chain management, what recommendations would you give somebody? Well, then I, I, I would go back to my college boy days and say, I wish to God I had had access to what's available to do today academically as well as for my summer jobs. I, I did do a few things in the summertime that were useful and, and looking back added value to my career portfolio. But there is a group, maybe you're familiar with it, Chris, called Kick Me, C-I-C-M-H-E the College Industry Council on Material Handling Education. It's a group of some 18 academics from various well-known institutions throughout North America and a couple from overseas who bands together to ensure that what they and their peers in academia are teaching to ensure that it matches what we on the supply side are doing in actuality. And uh, Kick Me is a tremendous resource. It operates under, again, the umbrella of MHI. And it's certainly where I would point someone considering after, after having teased him through the, or her through the door, where I'd point them for next steps. And I can't discount CSCMP or WORK or APEX or IIE as other resources that they might tap. It's been a fun run for me, and I certainly look forward to seeing people continue to enter our industry, both on management teams, supervisory teams, as well as people doing the work. Well, this has been great, John. I, I appreciate you investing time with me and sharing your perspectives. You know, I wish we had more time. I guess we could have another session if you're ever up for it. Don't tempt me, Chris. Sure. 
Well, I have a, I have a final final question. Back to the part one recording. You you mentioned uh, plain closed army. I, I don't know what that means. I didn't wear a uniform. Is that a special type of person, or you were a spy, or well, what's the I, I I I don't want to tease you with this, but it was a job uh, where I was able to. Uh, dress in mufti, I love that word, civilian clothes, and get things done in an efficient fashion with a very solid team of people, not behind en enemy lines in between two wars, that being World War II and Vietnam, or Korea and Vietnam. I don't mean to be mysterious, but that's enough. I was sure. in the Army. It taught me my single bad habit. I managed yep. to get rid of that four and a half years ago. Well, it's good for us. And again, thanks for your service. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. If you're interested in CSCP or other APIC certifications, there is a YouTube video where you can learn more about boot camp style workshops at Georgia Tech. Search on APIC's boot camp courses informational webinar. If you're in the North Georgia, North Alabama, Chattanooga area, check out the traditional class formats offered by the University of Tennessee Chattanooga Center for Professional Development. Optionally, the APIX coach can bring supply chain certification workshops to your company. Send a note to chris at apixcoach.com. Supply Chain is Boring is part of the Supply Chain Now Network. We try to highlight historical events, companies, and people in supply chain management and create a picture of where the industry is headed. Interested in learning more about supply chain technology startups, mergers, acquisitions, and how companies evolve, take a listen to Tequila Sunrise, crafted by Greg White. Or check out This Week in Business History with Supply Chain Now's own Scott Luton to learn more about everyday things you may take for granted and pick up short stories you can use as general conversation starters. The Logistics with a Purpose series puts a spotlight on neat and interesting organizations who are working toward a greater cause. And finally, if you're interested in logistics, freight, and transportation, take a listen to the new series, Jamin Logistics and Transportation Experience, with the Adapt and Thrive Mindset Sherpa, Jamin Alvadrez. If you're interested in sponsoring this show or others on Supply Chain Now, send a note to chris at supplychainnowradio.com. And remember, supply chain is boring.